this is the first time in my whole black life of being reached out to consistently for either apologies, condolences, hey, can you be a part of this conversation? So I guess what that tells me and all that I'm feeling and all that I'm hearing is that this is a moment. This is a moment. You know, this is not like a passing thing. This is something that wherever you are in life and wherever you sit in your faith or wherever, wherever you sit and trying to figure your own life out, this is a moment um, that will be something you'll look back on your life and, and you will be able to look at what you participated in, what you missed, what you got to see. Um, this will be a memorable thing for all of us. And so I think my goal here is just, you know, when I sat a few weeks ago, or no, it hasn't even been a few weeks, when the whole string of incidences took place. After, you know, after George Floyd's death, I remember sitting there and having conversations with friends and just being like, you know, the hardest part of it is having no idea where to start on how to just make it better. I mean, regardless of his color, regardless of any, you see an innocent person get murdered and you see it happen consistently and you're just like, yo, you know, there, there has to be something that I can do if I'm, if I'm professing this Holy Spirit filled faith that I can be a part of this mm -hmm. to make it not that way, you know? Um, so, you know, as the days go by, we end up, I end up downloading some thoughts just with friends and conversation. And, and really it, the last week for me has been a cycle of these same three ideas. Um, and they're, they're all really interconnected and I think they're all really basic, but super, super profound and deep in a lifetime of work. <laughs> Um, the first thing I think is just to acknowledge that this is a moment and, and I mean specifically to the racial conversation for the sides, unfortunately saying sides, just the privileged group and the non-privileged group, whatever they may look like. Um, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is a concern for maybe the people in a group like myself in an underprivileged group based on our appearance. If we're going to be ready for after years of, say, injustice, years of oppression, um, years of unfairness, to once now people are actually starting to listen if we are going to have something productive and usable to say for ourselves. Um, because we all know we've been in situations where you've been so angry for so long, when, they actually, when the other person lets you talk, you just keep yelling. That, that doesn't actually help the new future. And so I think about my people and I'm, I'm hopeful that the right people would be put in the, right in the right place at the right time to speak well for the type of future that we envision for ourselves. Um, because, and even just biblically, you think about Israel, 400 years of slavery, and how long before they were asking to go back? Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like, there's, there's a newfound responsibility that comes with opportunity that an underprivileged group may not have access to understanding. You know, so I think our, our situation was a little unique because like Phil said, I played in the league for a long time. And just by default, you know, if you don't buy a car every week, you're going to have a lot of money at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? So being in a, in a group in society that does get privileges just because of having a certain amount of money, you realize, you know, like when I grew up, I grew up in a pretty stereotypically bad neighborhood with guns, you know, drug, drug activity, prostitutes, and just what you see on TV when they make a bad neighborhood, what it looks like, that's what my neighborhood looked like in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and if you ask nine out of 10 people in those situations, what would make their life better? They're just going to say money. But how many of you guys know people with a lot of money and a whole lot of problems still? You see what I mean? So I don't want the people in the underprivileged group to think that once they get a chance to speak for themselves, everything will be fixed. There's still going to be a whole, net, a whole new skill set that comes with having access that's going to have to be acquired over time to make the change sustainable and productive for the following generations. You guys follow? That's one thing I think about. I think on the other side of this moment, the privileged group that's, it's, you know, almost passing the baton, if you will. It's like, it's almost like when I was playing in the league, um, I replaced, not replaced because he was not good anymore, but if you guys remember Brian Erlacher, I was his backup. He's a Hall of Fame player. And so there was this time period when he was going to be retiring soon and I was still playing a lot where he was having to teach me his job so that I could carry it on and do what I needed to do. And so there's that little bit of that tension where, you know, they talk about in psychology, when you see a privileged group have the, the playing field actually leveled, they feel a sense of injustice. 
because something's being taken from them, it's loss. Um, even though things are being equalized, there's the real sense and that exposure to the feeling of injustice. And so I'm wondering, you know, these text messages that I'm getting from people on the privileged side, they're like, I want to do anything I can to help if there's the awareness that there's going to be a pain associated with that service, a real pain and a real sense of maybe that something's happening to you that you don't like and that is not right. Um, so just dealing with the, you know, the, the emotional stress of that transition, I think is something real. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the hope lies in the last two parts, which is, you know, this idea that there's no systematic transformation without individual transformation, because the systems only reveal the desires of the people. You know, we make things, we make structures and frameworks to support what we want to happen. And so the system is, is messed up, but that's only a roundabout way of saying we are messed up, <laughs> you know. Um, but the good thing is that we have in our faith a built-in plan for that. And that's our faith in Jesus because his whole plan for our lives is not to just love us and have us go be in heaven with him later after we die. He wants to immediately transform us into what he saw in us when he created us. You know, he wants to immediately get to work on that. And the cool thing about that is that the things that he wants to create us into for our lives to feel like we're living to the fullest are immediately and directly attached to the needs of other people. You see what I mean? So the way that we create systems when we're people is like, I was telling Phil a minute ago, we have a tendency to create systems that, you know, for my life to go the way I want it to, it's going to have to cost you something. Or it's going to have to, you're going to have to do without something for me to have all the things I think I need. Um, it's evident specifically in this conversation. I was just talking to a friend earlier this week. She's a, a white woman from South Georgia, and she went to UGA. And in college, her freshman year, she noticed that like a bunch of people were getting, getting flack and backlash for putting Confederate flags in their dorm room windows. And, you know, she didn't really have an opinion on either side, but she just felt like people should be able to put up the flag because that's their Southern pride, you know, symbol. There's nothing racist about it or inherently wrong. So she felt so strongly she went to go and write this, almost like an editorial piece for the school paper. Um, and the UGA Journalism School, if you guys don't know, is like, that's where the Peabody Award comes from, the, like the journalism big prize. So this is a big deal. She took on this whole thing, this research on like, is the Confederate flag a big deal? Because in the Georgia state flag is actually a small Confederate flag, like pieced into it. And so she's, you know, going into this project thinking it's gonna be this Georgia pride statement. And she realizes that the Confederate flag entered the Georgia flag when the delegates were about to meet from the North and the South to prepare to start having talks about the Constitution. And it says that in these, and these, she's showing me like textbook references where the Southern delegates wouldn't even come to the table if slavery was going to be negotiable. They 100% would not talk about unifying the country unless they could keep hands off of slavery being a thing. That was a system that we started before we even wrote up We the People and anything. They just like, well, first of all, we have slavery. We're keeping that. What's next? And so I say that just to say that when we're left to our own devices to make up systems, it's in God we trust, but it's dot, dot, dot to help me with what I want to have happen. Do you know what I mean? It's not really trusting his plan, and that's just all of our defaults. And so I think that just at this moment, it's so critical to understand that, that whether we have been active participants or not, we have lived just in how it is. And so we do have to start from the ground up, which is belief systems of, in, of individuals um, to make any progress. But that, again, that's the good news because we can only control our own mess anyway. Um, why I think that's important, something that I was just alluding to, the third, the third idea is that as believers specifically, we're so much more interconnected than I think we, than we give credit to or we give power to. We have such a great responsibility to, you know, the way that your walk with Christ ends up has a lot to do with my walk. For example, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for two or three men in my life that really took God seriously at an early age, that our paths just so happened to intersect at that right moment. And certainly God can work around any of our, our mistakes, but to make God have to work around the things that we negate or the things that we choose not to do, 
you know, that may, may, it may be a part of some of the undue suffering that we see, I believe. And so I think the way to think about it for me is, you know, I played on teams for a long time. And so teamwork, you know, something we talk about in our house all the time. And teamwork, I think, is great and it's powerful, but it's not quite the same as being one body. I think that there's a really important distinction because you know this better than I do. I'm, you know, there's this idea that as churches, it may be different denominations or even different Calvaries around the world. You know, you can be like, you know, we're teammates trying to achieve a goal, but really we're a single body. And the significance of that shows up, I think, in times in hardship, because a lot of times injuries happen, of course, in football. When I saw my teammates get hurt, I felt bad. It definitely affected the team outcome. But at the end of the day, the recovery and the rehab was on the injured person. You see what I mean? But when I had an injury to myself, to my own body, the ownership of the rehab process was squarely on me. And so I think that when we see things that are happening, that believers have a part in that's hurting God's plan, we have to understand that that is not somebody else's thing that we can hopefully be a part of making better. That's literally us participating in our own walk, that it will sovereignly somehow intersect with wherever God has the next move for us in our life. You guys feel me?